It's February 2003. I'm minutes away from fulfilling a lifelong ambition. This Hercules aircraft is flying me and a team of winter warfare specialists deep into the wildest mountain plateau in Europe. Once we leave the plane, we'll have to survive in the harshest conditions a Norwegian winter can throw at us. Our packs are our life support system. We've got everything in there that we're going to need to survive and live down on the Hardanger Plateau. Tents, sleeping bags, spare clothes, food, water, fuel, the works. It all comes to a total of about 20 kilos. 60 years ago, a team of highly motivated commandos made this same jump. The stakes could not have been higher. If the men had failed in their mission, Hitler would have had a crucial advantage in the race to build an atomic bomb. And the world might have been a very different place. We're going to re-examine a mission that was so secret, it would be many years before the world knew exactly what the men had achieved. Theirs was an incredible story of survival, and they would become one of the most celebrated commando teams of the Second World War. History would remember them as the heroes of Telemark. Great night. Amazing sight! the Hardanger Plateau in southern Norway. The sun's been up for about an hour and in a few hours time it'll be gone again. This has got to be one of the hardest environments on earth to survive in, be your animal or man. The Hardanger Plateau lies between jagged peaks and deep fjords. It forms the rugged heart of the Telemark region of southern Norway. 60 years ago this innocent looking factory on the edge of the plateau was the object of an extraordinary commando raid, which would have been impossible but for the ability of a dedicated group of saboteurs to survive in the mountains through one of the harshest winters on record. These men are the real heroes of Telemark. If the name is familiar, it's probably because of the movie made in 1965, but the film took huge liberties with the real story glossing over what I think are the most remarkable aspects in favour of action and romance invented by the scriptwriters. It was, it was completely hopeless. It, it, was, it was not correct. You should have put a thumb down for it and said, this is nonsense. It's pure Hollywood. All of it is nonsense. It's terrible. Maybe it's a good film, but it's nothing to do with the, with, the, with the operation. And for me, the film really missed the key point, which was the men's ability to survive in these mountains and endure the most horrendous conditions that actually made the operation possible. That's why I've always wanted to tell the true story. I want to tell how the four-man advanced party endured an epic 15-day march to the target, hauling a quarter of a tonne of kit through blizzards and deep snowdrifts. How they went for so long on such a meagre diet that they suffered malnutrition, and how they had to endure four winter months in the wild after the initial plan went down in flames. This was their target, the Norsk Hydro Factory near the town of Rukan. In 1940, this was the only place in the world that was producing a substance known as heavy water, an innocuous-looking chemical with appalling potential in the wrong hands. The heavy water that was produced here looked 
and tasted exactly like ordinary water, but there was one key difference. It contained the component deuterium instead of hydrogen, making it 10% heavier. If you look at these ice cubes, if I take this one, which is made of ordinary water, it floats, while this one, watch, this is heavy water. It sinks like a stone to the bottom. Heavy water can be used to slow down the speed at which neutrons are set free in a nuclear reactor, basically the first step in the production of an atomic bomb. As the Germans invaded Norway in 1940, both they and the Allies were involved in a race to build the first atomic bomb. But the Nazis now had a crucial advantage. The plant, with its deadly output, was in their control. It was the darkest day in my life when the Germans had taken over. My hope was to get over to Britain and get some training and back again. The obvious solution was for the Allies to destroy the factory, but its location made it virtually impossible to attack. The surrounding mountains ruled out a low-level bombing raid, so the answer had to be a direct assault, with enough troops to storm the only access point, a narrow bridge over a 300-foot gorge. The British came up with a radical plan, the longest ever deployment of troops by glider. But they would need an advanced party to find a landing site. And this is where the heroes of Telemark come in. Since the Nazi invasion, Norwegians had been escaping across the North Sea, hoping for a role in the war. From the hundreds now living in Britain, four with the necessary survival skills would be chosen for the job among the first to be recruited were Jens Anton Poulsen and Klaus Helberg. Then living in London, both had grown up in the shadow of the Norsk hydro plant, and they were old friends having gone to school together in Rücken. Since I was a small boy, my main interest had been outdoor life, hunting, fishing, take care of yourself in the mountains, and, uh, and so on. When I was 15 years old, I had decided to become an officer. So this was very natural for me. We all hoped to get back as soon as we could. So I was very glad when I heard that we were going to be sent to Norway. The other two members of the team were Arne Hjelstrup, who died in 1995, and Knut Haugland. We did know nothing. <laughs> It was so strange. We had a meeting and um, we were told only that uh, you're going on a very, very important mission. The whole operation, codenamed Operation Grouse, was recreated for this 1948 film. What's amazing about this footage, shot just five years after the events it portrays, is that it stars three of the four original members of Grouse. And so Trunster wishes his men Godspeed. The leader, Lieutenant Jens Anton of Poulsen, wireless operator Knut Haugland. And I was told that the operation was very important. If the Germans got hold of the heavy water, they would be able to blow up some part of London. I didn't believe him. I think, you tell me this because you want us to do a, a, a good job. And I hadn't, I hadn't a clue of what heavy water was and how it was going to be used. Alongside instruction in sabotage and undercover operations, the men had to be trained to parachute. None of them had ever jumped before, but because they were so short of time, they had to make do with just three practice drops before being parachuted into Norway in the winter, in the dead of night. Sixty years on, this is where my journey and their footsteps really takes off. Like them, I'm learning to parachute from scratch. I have to convince the Norwegian army that they can safely drop me on the Hardanger Plateau in winter. First, nine drops in 